So good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for our Monty Hardcast conference again. Uh, we're really fortunate to have Prof. Ali Debacker, who's a really good friend. Uh, Ali works at Riggs Hospital in Copenhagen, uh, and he's truly an expert in structural heart. I've you know, seen his career grow over numerous years, and he's now really an authority in LAA closure, in DAVA, in many different procedures. So we're really lucky, Ali, for you to share your experience with us on LA closure because at, at Riggs, I mean, you guys really have set the stage on how we do how we do these procedures, how we make choices as far as device selection, and you've also had exposure to lots of devices. So we're all looking forward to hearing you talk. Thank you so much. No, thanks, Azim, uh, for the introduction. Um, I hope you can see indeed the screen and the slides. So let me first say something indeed about our LA program. So. Um, the LA program started roughly 10 years ago, 10, 11 years ago. And then it has been in the first couple of years, it was really a low volume of, uh, let's say, 20, 25 cases a year. And then uh, six, seven years ago, um, I also, we, we inherited the, the, the LA program, closure program from another colleague. And we really went out to, uh, to give presentations and referring hospitals and uh, even directly to patients and these patient communities, et cetera, to just make uh, therapy awareness. And that really paid off because the years after we suddenly got now, now we get uh, almost 125 referrals a year. Um, and yeah, so we even have to deny patients from the therapy because we don't have slots enough. And um, we already started very early, also 10 years ago, already to, to, do, uh, to look if we could do these cases without transesophageal echo, to come away from the uh, general anesthesia and do them in, in local anesthesia with ICE guidance, with intracardiac echo. So we, I think we were the first site doing this. And uh, of course, a key element in this, in doing ICE guided LA closure is for us having a cardiac CT. I know that probably in the most of the centers, it's still a TEE guided procedure. And then I think you can also easily do it without a cardiac CT up front. But on the other hand, if you do a cardiac CT up front, you get so much more information out of that cardiac CT to understand really the anatomy of the LA. And that's a, a part of it I have in this particular presentation. And then of course, also on uh, how to really implant uh, the case. So this is something uh, that most of you probably maybe already have seen before. So this is a, a typical TEE image, uh, let's say a 45 degree. Yeah, you can see it's a 45 degree here. And then this is what you typically measure if you do an amulet uh, implantation. If you do an, a Watchman or a Watchman flex implantation, typically you only measure the ostium and then it's not particularly the ostium that you measure here from uh, the, the, the real anatomical uh, ostium up to the common and rich, then I would think, do you see the mouse on the screen? Do you see my uh, cursor? Yes, we do. Yeah, so yes. then you would, uh, you, you would measure probably for a Watchman Flex, I think you would measure something in the middle. So you would measure probably from here, this is a circumflex artery. So from uh, roughly here in the middle of that circumflex, probably to, to almost uh, on the other end uh, to, to there where that B is standing. That's what you would measure as your ostium for a Watchman Flex. So those, don't min misunderstand that these measurements, what they call ostium, it's not, first of all, always the anatomical ostium. And an ostium measuring for amulet is different as when you talk uh, about an ostium for a watchman or a watchman flex. So this is for an amulet. You see then what you really do is trying to go for the anatomical ostium all the way up to the commandant ridge. Then you go 10 millimeters in and then you make a real measurement of your diameter of your landing zone, as they call it. So you have two measurements for amulet. You have typically that one particular measurement. Uh, again, on this right-sided uh, figure, I would, for a Watchman Flex, probably measure something just in the middle of these two lines as my ostium that I want to uh, implant my, my Watchman Flex. So, and this you measure at 0, 45, 90, and 135 degrees if you use TEE. Um, what is, of course, the limitation of LA imaging with TEE? I would say, well, it's... Oh, it's not always possible to get a full 3D overview of the LA, especially if there are different lobes and uh, different crazy um, orientations of these lobes. Sometimes you simply miss this on TEE. There's also quite a lot of variability of these measurements, both interoperator but also interpatient. I will show you later why this is. 
uh, there's no visual accordance with the fluoroscopy imaging. So if I see a t an, an, uh, an appendage on a TEE, it's still hard to visualize me completely how this will look on fluoroscopy. I would say you can do it with experience, but still, if you have a CT, you can do much more. And of course, you need to do TE. So it's discomfort for the patient if you do it pre procedure And if you do the procedure, for us, this means we have to do it in local anesthesia or at least conscious sedation. I can tell you, we do our LA closures in local anesthesia without anesthesia in the room and just with intracardiac echo. So that makes the logistics just easier. So what is a problem if you do TE-based sizing in an appendage? The problem is that even if you do correctly all these measurements on 0, 45, 90, and 135 degrees. And typically on 135 degrees, you measure kind of your largest diameter. Diameter, And if you do this for a Watchman Flex, then you measure this at the ostium level. Still, the problem is that if you're TE probe, you're not sure that this, this turning, this, uh, this, these images, they have the center uh, point in really the center of your appendage. That, that's, that's a problem. So what you think you measure as your max diameter is probably an underestimation in most of the cases, or at least in there's an error margin on it. So the, the good thing with CT is that what you really measure on CT, the actual uh, maximum diameter that you measure or the perimeter derived mean diameter is also the real true maximum of perimeter derived mean diameter of that appendage. So your measurements are more accurate. And that's also what we see in our praxis, I would say, Typically, what you do, if you do TEE-based sizing, you measure your ostium, your maximum, and then you have to add, you have to follow these, these, flow, these charts the, from the, these instructions for use of the company, which comes down on typically oversizing or adding five millimeters, roughly three to six millimeters. So you measure something, let's say for an amulet, you measure the landing zone uh, and an ostium, a landing zone of a maximum of um, let's say 23, then you probably will have to go for a 28 millimeter AMOLED device. Whereas if you measure on CT, you typically only oversize slightly, like only two millimeters. You don't oversize with five millimeter. And that's simply a result of the fact that on CT, your measurement is more accurate, is more closer to the real actual, it's what you measure is a real actual diameter of that appendage. And you also see that in the limits of agreement, so that there's a bigger error margin. And that also makes that with TEE-based sizing, you not always bullseye on the correct um, size or device size selection. So sometimes you have to change in the procedure to another device size because you were just simply wrong. You, you oversized too much or you undersized, in fact, too much. Whereas with CT-based sizing, if you do this, it's in 95 to 96% of cases that you are you're correct, uh, you have made the correct device size selection. So that's what it says here. You see on pre-procedural uh, CT, you see all the possible uh, 3D, uh, you have a proper 3D overview, all the possible lobes there are. There is limited variability. If I measure it or a fellow measure it, that we typically have the same measurements for the ostium and the landing zone. We also have visual accordance with the fluoroscopic angles. You can turn that 3D reconstructed CT image to an REO call, and you can see if this is a, a good implantation view, yes or no. It's limited discomfort for the patient, and it gives you the possibility to perform these cases in LA uh, in local anesthesia with uh, eyes. So I think these are some uh, some some advantages of preoperative planning with cardiac CT. You have a full 3D uh, overview. You have more accurate measurements of the dimensions. You also can really pre-procedurally determine what is the optimal C-arm implantation view. Let's say, for example, in this particular case, it's an REO 35 caudal 8. So you don't have intra-procedurally shoot a lot of contrast uh, in a caudal, REO caudal, caudal, REO cranial, and lose a lot of uh, injections there and, and give your patient unnecessary contrast in order to obtain a good or the best implantation view. You can do this uh, just upfront based on the cardiac CT images. You can even determine what the best transeptal puncture site will be. And also there for an LAA closure, as you probably know, the best or the most recommended uh, puncture site is an infro posterior. It's true in, I would say, 80-85% of cases that you an infro posterior transeptal puncture is the best. For sure, 100% of cases inferior. You never want to puncture superior. But it's not always true that you want a very, very posterior puncture. Let's say you have a reverse chicken wing 
or a ver very vertical takeoff of your appendage, you even want to avoid a very posterior puncture. There you want to go more for a central, like an inferior, but central puncture. So you can also see this and, and determine this on your pre-procedural CT. And then even for the future, or actually this is things that we do already some in some particular cases, you can even have computational modeling where you, you there's software available nowadays from some companies like Feops. They can come very reliably make computational models and see which device size is the best, will give you the proper device uh, compression and also closure of the appendage. And you can even fuse some of these images uh, like like some uh, re repair points like the, the landing zone, the ostium, also the fossa ovalis. You can fuse these CT uh, generated uh, images on, on your fluoroscopy. So these, is, these are softwares where you can do this with uh, your, of course, Osirix, Horus, it's free software, Trimensio. There's a package in Trimensio also for LA, which is very easy, Materialize also has, and then this is for the computational modeling. So this is, just to give you an example, this is, for example, the Trimensio module for LA. So you see, first of all, this goes all full automatic. So it, it generates this 3D reconstructed image. You can decide where you put this landing zone and ostium. Uh, if you're not happy with it, you can just simply move them more distal or more proximal as you as you think it should be. And then uh, here you click on this measure ostium and then you you can move. So here this is the, the phase where I optimize my real ostium. So here I think this is my ostium that I want to define. I check if it's all correct. It's it's kind of the same as determining where where your analyst is for, for a TAVI procedure. So here I determine, is this looking correct? Is this my real ostium that I want to consider as my ostium to close with the disc of an amulet or even in case of an, a watchman flex as this could also be uh, a good ostium. And then here, now I go further to my landing zone, which is typically, as you see, this is 9.7 or 10 millimeters more distal in the appendage. And then this is a semi-generated semi uh, line. You can, of course, as you know, this uh, you, can, uh, you can also adapt it. And then, so you, you have these measurements on your ostium and your landing zone. And then you can even turn this model. As you can see, this is now I'm turning it to REO 35, 40 even. And this is a, a much, you see the heart more from a lateral view. So this is better. Typically your LA closure procedures, you always do from an REO view an REO 30 or 25 to 35 degrees. And then you compensate a little bit of cranial caudal that depends on the orientation of the heart and the patient. But here I would say a kind of neutral or this is cranial four is probably a good implantation view. So you try to avoid as much as possible overlap with the appendage and the left atrium. You try to align the ostium and the landing zone as good as possible. But here you see, we have to make, make a compromise and then you try to avoid for shortening also of your appendage. So here in this particular case, what do we have? So you see, what am I interested in? If you make a measurement, this is now for amulet, I would say. For amulet, I measure an ostium and 10 millimeters deeper into the appendage, a landing zone. So I measure a max diameter for your ostium of 31.5. So that's the only important measurement I would say for the ostium It's the maximum diameter. I'm not so much interested in perimeter or minimum a perimeter drive mean diameter or minimum diameter, just the maximum diameter. I want to have a disc that covers that ostium here. And then I look to the landing zone and there I see I'm interested in both the maximum diameter and the perimeter derived mean diameter. And then I want, of course, to have a device where there is some compression. So depending on the device sizes there are available for AMLET, I would think of, for example, a 25 device. For a uh, Watchman Flex, I would think of 24 or maybe 27. That's probably where it would go through. But then knowing that this ostium is 31.5, I would, for a Watchman Flex, definitely go for definitely go for 27 and maybe even consider then the even larger one, um, the, the 31. But uh, for, an, for an amulet, probably a 25, this gives an, an, a big enough uh, disc because I think for a 25, you have to add eight millimeters to get the di to disc size. So that would give a 33 disc si uh, size. Oh yeah, here you see it. So this is a 25 amulet. It gives actually plus seven, plus seven millimeters. Then you get the ostium. So 32 that covers also the maximum diameter of this ostium. So in this particular case, I would probably go for a 25 millimeter device. And you see for Watchman Flex, it's all, uh, it comes with their own delivery sheets. 
for the Watchman Flex, it comes with the True Seal access system, which is always a 14 French. For the AMOLED device, it comes with either a 12 French for the smaller device sizes and with a 14 French for the larger devices. But even if you would think of a 25 and you're a bit borderline that you doubt would I take a 25 or 28, you see a 25 fits in a 12 French. But let's say you're in the procedure and you find out it's not enough compression, you have to switch a 25 to a 28. I would personally advise to go then for a 14 French from in the beginning because these smaller devices sizes they also, of course, fit in a 14 French. So especially if I'm working with a 25, I, I just introduce a 14 French sheet for the very small device sizes you can clearly do with a 12 uh, French. So what is the optimal implantation view? I would say it's a view where you have indeed the ostium and the landing zone as good as possible aligned. But you see here, I have to make a compromise. There's as minimal LA for shortening. Uh, because if you go to an, an LAO view, you will not see your LA in the full length. You will just see it from a frontal view. So you will see it extremely foreshortened. So that's why you never do an LA closure in an LAO view. And you want minimal overlap between the left atrial appendage and left atrium. So that's why you have to compensate either a little bit cranial or coal. But that's depending on the anatomy and the orientation of the heart, patient per patient, patient specific. So here it was an RO39 cranial four, that was kind of the best implantation view. And then here, this is something to illustrate you on that you can also, if you do cardiac CT, you can also indicate where your fossa ovalis is. And then you can even have an assessment on where your transeptal puncture will best be. And you can here, here you can clearly see you turn it more open to an REO view. So this is of course the anterior side. This is the posterior side. This is inferior and this is the posterior side. So here we're going to an REO almost 45 degrees. We have a real lateral view. So this would be a very posterior puncture. And then you see you come very nice into the axis, the central axis of the appendage. So that would be good. An anterior puncture would give less good alignment with the central axis. So for this particular anatomy, I would say a posterior transeptal puncture will be better than an anterior transeptal puncture. And then also here we go to an LAO view where you almost where you close completely your interatrial septum and your fossa valis and then you can see an inferior puncture of course that's almost in 100 of cases an inferior puncture will give you a better alignment with the central axis than a superior uh, puncture so uh, if you do an la closure percutaneous la closure always go as inferior as you can i would say with your transeptal puncture if you don't have CT up front and you don't have good uh, echo images even, yeah, then you shouldn't start with the case. But if you have, uh, you're have, you still doubting on echo and you have to make a bet, of course, your posterior puncture would be better. But otherwise, for only reverse chicken wing cases, you for sure have to avoid also posterior puncture. So that's what you see here. Typically, you go, come, most of the appendages are like this, uh, this orientation, where it goes anterior, um, and that's 80-85% of cases, even if it's a windsock or this is now more a kind of a windsock uh, chicken wing, but infra posterior puncture is the best. Whereas if you have a reverse chicken wing where that appendage makes a posterior turn, of course there it's logical, you don't want to come from posterior, you, you will have a better alignment in that appendage with even a central, central anterior puncture. Yeah. But this is the exception, it's 10% of your cases. Yeah, this is something uh, more research. Uh, I'm not going to go in, in detail, but that's just to tell you if you do, I, I still, of course, in the US, it's mostly Watchman Flex that's still implanted. So I'm not a big fan of only measuring your ostium. Of course, that's the most important measurements, but I would say look further than just that one single measurement you make, even if it's on TEE. Don't make only a measurement of that ostium. Also make a measurement a couple of millimeters lower, more distal. Because it's the same as you would do at Tavi by measuring only the annulus. I mean, why wouldn't you look and make a measurement of the LVOT, of the SOV, of the ST junction? You want to understand that whole anatomy a bit. And that can have big consequences on whether you would, it can accommodate a larger device or not. And why is this? Uh, well, look at, look at this, for example. This is for these three examples. The ostium and even a landing zone, they are the same in all three. So geographically they're exactly the same the ostium and the landing zone still i would for example in the middle in the middle configuration morphology if you would have an appendage like this which let's say 
would be the majority of your cases has this kind of shape. Uh, if this is the ostium and 10 millimeters distal, it's the landing zone. You still have typically some good depth of, of two or more centimeter. So then I would say, for example, if it would be an amulet, this could accommodate a 25 millimeter. Whereas if I have the scenario on the right hand side where you have a really big appendage, even in the distality, it goes even even tight, tightly tapers up or, or, or enlarges uh, again, or at least, you know, you have really good depth, then you could go even for a 28 millimeter device. Whereas if you know that your appendage is very tapered, even with your same measurements of your ostium and your landing zone, but you know you hardly have any depth beyond these 10 or 12 millimeters, it may even push you to just go for the smaller device at 22, because you're afraid that you won't have a lot of space and you will anchor your device in the distality of that appendage. So you see, even with measuring just an ostium and even a landing zone, which you don't do for a Watchman Flex, they only let you measure for the official instructions for use of the device, only an ostium. Uh, if, if you measure this one measurement, just look further than that ostium and make your measurements, have a, a global overview, over uh, an, an overall overview on this appendage how tapered it is, if it's not tapered, if it's if it's really large, uh, and what the measurements are, uh, 10 or, or 15 millimeters more distal from the ostium. So then, um, then for the case, of course, well, what you want to obtain is, yeah, you want to have a good device size selection, but you also want to obtain a, an optimal implantation. And what's an optimal implantation? Of course, an implantation where your device doesn't embolize, that's one thing but especially also where you obtain as good as possible closure uh, with. And that we know is not always easy. Um, well, if we do control TEE after the case, we know that majority of cases, 98% of cases, you have almost no period device leaks, but that's, and, and then I mean period device leaks of more than three millimeters, because sometimes you see minor period device leaks, but they, are con they can be considered as non-significant still. We know that if we do cardiac CT post-procedurally, as we do in Copenhagen for the last four years, there is actually in 30, 35%, and sometimes even in 40% of cases, some, some contrast still leaking into the appendage, whether it's through the device, or, and that's probably most of the cases, or besides para device, that we don't really know, we don't fully understand all this, but it's just to tell you that having a complete occlusion of your appendage is not always that easy, and that's why, I think um, computational modeling can help us. For example, this is a, a challenging case. We saw this was a reverse chickowing. So we were doubting what kind of device or what kind of device size to do. So we asked them to do some modeling. Here you see this was an AMOLED 18 millimeter in a proximal position that they simulated. And they can really very reliably uh, simulate uh, these host device, uh, sorry, the yeah, device host interactions because it's based on algorithms of and that or artificial intelligence, these computers, they maintain already procedure and procedural results of several hundreds of cases. So the, the predicted compression uh, and behavior of the device is typically very correct. So here you see, this would not be enough. You typically want the compression of your device of more than 10 to 15, more than 15%, I would say. Typically for both AMOLED and Watchman Flex, you aim for a compression of roughly 20%. That's kind of ideal. So here I would say the right-sided scenario would be acceptable, an 18 and a distal position. However, they also simulated the 20. So you see that even in a proximal position, it would just be enough, 70% compression, no real leak, and in a distal position, also 28%. So having this simulation and this information, I would say I would go for an AMOLED 20 here because I can come away with both a distal and a proximal implantation. And maybe even I'm lucky and I can even implant it more distally where it comes to sit sandwiched, as we call it. That means sandwich. That means that one of a part of this lobe comes to sit in this, uh, in this wing, in this chicken wing or reverse chicken wing in this particular case. So for this particular case, we went for percutaneous LA closure and local anesthesia, ice guidance, the Amplatzer steerable delivery sheet because they come with a steerable sheet. Uh, nowadays, uh, and I would go here for an AMOLED 20 millimeter. So, so this is so that this steerable is, uh, sheet. The new oh, I will uh, maybe it's mute this. 14 French system with um, you can still hear me, I guess. So this is uh, the steerable sheet. This is rather new. It only came half a year ago on the market. So this is a 14 French sheet. 
this is the the handle at the at the end and this is where we do the flexion uh you will clear you will soon see so here that's even with the drawing on it so this is you go clockwise to flex the tip of your of your delivery sheet and you go counter clock to uh take the flexion out so to extend the the, the sheet tip so you will see that now i think yeah here so here this is the tip so now we're flexing we're going clockwise you see that and then you can even bend it very much and you see here at the same time this is the eyes by the way here on the in the other groin and now i'm going counter clock so now we're extending this step of this delivery sheet so that's something which is really handy and uh, practical to optimize the alignment with the central axis yes so here we're ready to go in uh, so this is our setup if we do eyes guided la closure we have a guy who's really our ice specialist i would say nils weilstrup he's he's assisting us in all these cases with ice we can also do it ourselves in some particular cases where he's not there i do the ice myself but still it's more easy and comfortable to just focus on my my la closure procedure and then i have him standing on the other side with his ice catheter through a 10 french sheet uh, which is also venous access and then of course if you do ice guided la closure then you also go across uh, the transeptal puncture site with your ice uh, catheter so you have both the, your delivery system of your la closure device and your ice probe through the same uh, transeptal puncture site yeah so here you see i went uh, across uh, the interatrial septum i have both my delivery sheet and my ice my eyes is in the left upper pulmonary vein and you see that the alignment is really lousy as yes? it's it's very bad because it's a it's a reverse checkering i i come not very nice into the dependence so now what i will do is i will you see my hand here so I, i'm unflexing so i'm unflexing this delivery sheet going a little bit counter clock even with my entire uh, system and then the alignment with the appendage left atrial appendage central axis will improve yeah so I, I always do it with a pigtail on the end. So that's always safer. So there's no uh, sharp, sharp edges. I can also see on my eyes very nicely here. This is my appendage. This is my circumflex artery. I have my pigtail in there. And now my alignment, you see I'm, I'm, I'm counterclocking now my entire handle. So going more anterior, counterclocking. And I gave them that counterclock on my tip to take the bend out of my catheter delivery sheet tip and now i'm going to check again with contrast i think yeah so this was initially very bad uh arrival into the appendage and what i have now so let's check it i think i'm soon going to check it with contrast so the alignment is much much better so that's an advantage nowadays with these steerable delivery sheets amulet uh, for the amulet device yeah you see so now i come nicely into the appendage uh the central like so that's going to improve that's going to make it much more easy facilitate uh, to Im have a, an easier implantation but also we know that if you want to obtain complete la closure with no remaining leaks it's important to implant these devices uh with coaxial alignment if the, those cases with bad leakages para device leakage are those cases where there is a bad alignment between the device and the la so here this is the implantation technique so we're typically what we do is we do we unsheet this until we have the ball shape so we don't necessarily push this device out we mostly unsheet we have the ball shape that's both for amulet and for watchman flex then we take our time we can look on the, on the eyes or on the echo you see we have good depth but we can maybe still even go a bit deeper i can give a little bit of contrast yeah now i cannot go really deeper here i you see i'm, I'm at the edge so now what i'm going to do is we're going to push the device mostly out we keep our delivery sheet stable in position we're not going to retract it too much otherwise the device will jump forward so we keep the device and we mostly push the device here with the right hand we will push the device slowly slowly out so now we have the triangular shape as we call it and then suddenly it will form itself the entire lobe. I'll try to push it, even the delivery sheet, a little bit forward so I can maybe even get this part of the lobe in that reverse chicken wing. That's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, and we're succeeding. Yeah, so now the lobe has been formed. 
and then you can even make at this stage an, an additional contrast injection that's not absolutely needed but if you want to do it you can check it yeah and that sits good so you see this part of the lobe sits indeed in that reverse chickering so that's actually good here we see some compression on that uh, device so that's also good and now you just form the disc. How do you do that? You keep the cable steady, the cable with the device on, and you just unsheet. You bring back the delivery sheet, and then the, the, the disc will come automatically out. Yeah. So you, what do we see is we see a nice compression of the lobe, what we want to see. And visually, you can assess it with, with experience. That's typically also what you do on AMOLED, but also on Watchman Flex. You, can, you, you have to learn to assess this compression a rate so here i would say we have roughly 20 percent compression we have it sits nice in the axis of the appendage it's distal of the circumflex uh, artery on the ice if i go back on the ice uh let's see where i see a good ice image yeah here so the circumflex artery is there so two-thirds of this lobe is distal of the circumflex artery so that's also what you have to obtain we see a nice separation of the disc and the lobe they're not exactly beside each other they there's separation between that means there is some traction on this disc and probably a good ceiling and that this lobe is also anchored well and then the disc restores the concavity of the left atrium so these are five signs where you look at if you do an amulet implantation there are other signs to look at if you do a watchman flex maybe i still come to show that as well in the next video so this was the advantage of using the steerable sheet so you see here this was how we arrived initially and then by unflexing this tip, extending this tip, we could actually come better in alignment with the central axis of the appendage. And this is the same. So that's the first. Um, yeah, this is a small illustration of the fusion imaging. So here we fuse just the fossa ovalis and the landing zone and the ostium of that appendage, which we had from Trumensho from our CT analysis. We can project that reliably on our a uh, few on our fluoro and that helps us actually to really super easy find our, where our appendage is almost within five to ten seconds you find immediately where the appendage is you can help it can also help you in in implanting uh your device that you're to make to assure that you're deep enough of course you have your echo but it's just easy that it's it helps you it facilitates you to do so this could be maybe in the future be used more and more uh, if you have fusion imaging in your lab Okay, so this was the first presentation. I don't know if there's um, questions. Otherwise, I, I can share another video, which is really an, um, a Watchman Flex, um, um, Watchman Watch Flex implementation, if you want to see that. Yeah. <clears throat> Ali, why don't we do that, and then we can stop for questions. I think there'll be a lot of questions. Is that fine? About, yeah, that's fine. About device oh, sorry, I... because, you know, it's... Um, Emil is still pretty new in the US. So let's maybe watch the Watchman Flex and then we can stop and do questions at the end. Yeah, it's a v it's a uh, live case, which actually only takes and you, that's you see it takes. Do we have like 30 minutes still or you want to be sharp within time? Um, I prefer to leave about I mean, I prefer we could go another 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes and then have yeah, okay. questions. Good, then I'll try to uh, really important parts. Uh, this is a, this we can skip. That's just the pre-procedural planning. It's Maybe it's still interesting to have the pre-procedural planning. And, uh, yeah. she was um, and accepted for LA. Wait, I'm going to take the volume away. You can still hear what I'm saying. So, um, yes. so this is, uh, let's see to the anatomy of this particular case. So this is chicken wing morphology, uh, rather straightforward. Uh, windsock to, and then windsock to chicken wing. A maximum diameter of my ostium here of uh, 26.4. And then at the landing zone, a bit deeper in, a perimeter drive mean of 20 and a max diameter of 21. So I think I went here for a 27 millimeter device, Watchman Flex, uh, seeing these uh, measurements. And I think that's also uh, infra posterior transeptal puncture. So I, that's all. This is the 27 in a proximal. That's, of course, not good. This would be good. 17% compression with the 27 millimeter. And I think I also had simulations of a 24 and that showed it was too small. So then we go to the case. Um, so this is the puncture, transeptal puncture. Of course, uh, we want to go for an, uh, yeah, that's now a new transeptal puncture um, system, the VersaCross. I don't necessarily have to show that, I think. That's not what this session is about. Um, but this is, yeah, that's the VersaCross to, to puncture across. 
Yeah, now that VersaCross is a cross in the left atrium. So typically what we like to do is, to, otherwise if we don't use this uh, pre-shaped wire to, to get our stiff wire in the left upper pulmonary vein, get a wire there, exchange to a stiff, unplugged super stiff wire, and then we bring in our, um, our delivery system that will soon come here. Yeah, so here, this is an interesting moment. So here the eye catheter gets across also to the left atrium. So it, we see this wire. So now the eyes, you see, now the eyes is pushed over to the left atrium and we bring it also in the left upper pulmonary vein. So that slides rather easy through. And then we come here with our delivery system, uh, the, true, uh, the true seal access system, which comes with the Watchman Flex. We will also push across. So that uh, should come now. And you see from the beginning of uh, the procedure to, to the end of the procedure here in total, it only takes it. You do these cases in, in less than half an hour if you're really well prepared. Um, so now I'm sure the delivery system will come. Yeah, this is the delivery system. So now the delivery system is the left atrium. Then the next step I do is that I introduce a pigtail in this um, delivery system. Here you see, this is a six French uh, dilator. I just to introduce my, my J wire. Why do I do this? That's because it's impossible to introduce a pigtail directly in here through that hemostatic valve. But also I prefer to, to keep this hemostatic valve as much as possible closed. I don't want to open it because you have to be aware that you're working in the left atrium, that air gets sucked in rather easily. So you always have to keep it either uh, low uh, beside the leg level or at, that you're aware of it, what you're doing, that you have nice bleed back. You see now you have nice bleed back, of course, but I keep that valve as I don't screw it all the way open. So now my pigtail is coming. The pigtail comes first here. You will see that the pigtail is coming soon out. Yeah, the wire is out here. What you have to do then, it's best to have the curve of the pigtail upwards, facing upwards. And then you typically, what you almost always have to do, you will have to go counterclock. So you will have to make an anterior, what I'm doing here with my hands, anterior torque. So you see then what you, if what's happening if you're doing an anterior torque, a counterclock torquing, also your, your delivery sheet will make a counterclock movement. That's normal. Yes, you will torque anterior. And then almost immediately you will fall into the appendage. So now you see here on echo, my pigtail is in the, in the LA. This is the left atrial appendage. So my pigtail is in, and then you move your delivery sheet up to the ostium of your appendage. Then you go to your optimal implantation view, which is an RU30 and slightly cranial or caudal, depending on the anatomy of your patient. Now you see here on ice, my delivery sheet is nice at the ostium also. Uh, my ice catheter is in the left upper pulmonary vein. In this uh, here, you see it's an RU25 cranial one. So that's the view I'm working in. And then I'm making ready to a little bit of contrast, I would think. Uh, that's normally my next step. So you see it's only 50 minutes to the final length of this case, but I won't show everything and just the implantation still. But it's maybe interesting still to show here. What's interesting still here on this delivery system, um there are markers on so from this most distal marker band to the first marker band that's 21 millimeters so there is some you can do some fluoroscopic extra assessment but still i would say i don't i don't rely on my on my fluoroscopy and my angiography to to make my device size selection i'm mostly i fully trust on my ct but if you don't have ct you should trust more on your echo cardiographic measurements instead of your fluoroscopic measurements but it still gives you additional information. Yes, you know, so it's always nice to reconfirm it. So here you see it's uh, probably I want to land somewhere here with my device. Uh, so I'll, I will have to push it a little bit deeper in. But anyway, there's no need to push it very deep in already here. Now I'm preparing the device. And when I have the device, I'll go to that. Just I will let me move forward uh, three, four minutes. So now the device has been flushed, the 27. Now running to running connection. So we flush the device further and we open up this hemostatic valve. We, I tighten it a little bit again. Now the device will come. You will see that the device is coming because it has a uh, distal marker at its end. So now the device is pushed up and you will suddenly see a marker appearing. That's soon coming. Yeah, here the device is. So what you do is you bring this distal marker to the distal marker of your delivery sheet. So this is the device distal marker. I'm pushing it forward pushing it forward until this marker and marker comes together. Yeah, so I'm almost there. 
and look to my hand then also so i bring this marker to the i still have to bring it marker on marker i'm not there yet then i know my device which sits loaded until this distal marker in the in the delivery uh, system yeah we can jump over this this is just demonstration by the fellows how we would implant it but here you see now so this is interesting now i brought the marker on marker I'm, i think uh, or not yet yeah i'm gonna do it look i'm gonna bring the marker to marker then there's a small separation still here so now i bring marker to marker so now the, the device gets all the way to the this length of the delivery sheet also now you see if you go back to my hands you see there's still a couple of millimeters space between the this white part is from my device actually this with the cable and the and the sleeve that came with my device this is just the delivery sheet so that you see there's a separation of couple of millimeters what you do now is you keep your device so you keep this y connector with the device that controls the device you keep that on the leg of your patient's table and you retract your sheet you retract the sheet until it clicks it makes a click so now this delivery sheet has been pulled back yes it has been pulled back and made a click so now this part is frozen it's it's clicked together from now on i go to this uh, part to this hemostatic valve and then this distal end this uh, pusher will control my device okay so then you can forget about this part here they are connected and you just do your all implantation just with your delivery sheet and this final final pusher uh, to bring your device in place so i also have a look on echo here to see i look both on echo and fluoro typically um what I do here, I'm not very distal in, so what I'm going to do is here probably push my device mostly forward because I'm not afraid that I'm too, uh, I'm going to push it uh, through the wall. I'm, I'm, so you see, I've been pushing my, my device out until you have that ball shape. Now I verify on, on echo, I look nicely deep in. It's roughly a centimeter distal of this circumflex artery. That's typically a good, I'm also nice, good deep in on my fluoro. So what I will do here, probably this is even a little bit too deep. So what I will do is in the totality, the entire uh, on, yeah, the collection of device and delivery sheet, I will probably pull a little bit back because I'm afraid I would have an otherwise a two distal implantation. So I will pull back maybe two, three millimeters. Yeah, and then I will probably go for just a complete unsheet of my device. So I will not push my device more forward. I will just keep my device and unsheet. Yeah, so that's what I did here. And you see now this is the result on echo. That's typically a nice result. We, we, we don't have too much shoulder. So what is shoulder? Shoulder is at the side of the mitral valve or the circumflex artery that your device sticks a little bit out uh, of your ostium of your appendage. That's acceptable to accept with a Watchman Flex device for sure. You don't want to accept more than one third of the entire length of your device but that's for sure not here if anything it's maybe only 10 to 15 percent mm -hmm. and what we want is of course that we we cover all the trabicles and that's probably just the case so of course you're you're depending on the axis of your appendage how you can implant this device you cannot implant it more vertical because the appendage is going the wing is going uh, horizontal so it, the device it's normally it comes to sit horizontal but i want to check and be sure that i don't have an a, through protruding shoulder on the mitral side and that I have covered all the trabicles on the on this side. So maybe let's see if I still tucked on it. I think I still additionally tucked on it. I got it even a little bit more uh, proximal. And then this is the final release of the device. Uh, I wouldn't do the final release on the device in this status because I would always advise to come closer with your... So now I do a good tuck. Yeah, you see I'm doing a tuck test. So I'm pulling on the device to check if the device is good anchored and if it uh, changes from morphology. So here I would call it, it's like a bell shape. They call it a marshmallow shape. It's if it's just 10% compressed, compressed. If it's this form, it's kind of a bell shape. It's 20% compressed. And if it's even a little bit more compressed, it becomes like a hot dog, like a sausage. And then it's 30% compression. So that's a visual assessment of your of your compression so here it goes between a bell and a hot dog so 20 to 25 percent compression that's i would say it's perfect that's perfection and i've covered all trabicularization so i'm probably very happy with this implant and i'm going to release it so before the release i'm going to of course bring this delivery sheet yeah this is something what you see so this movement of that uh, of that pusher um that means that it's connected with that uh, that's typically a good sign that it's it's good anchored and it moves together with the heart of your patient 
So um, a final injection here. Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy. I could implant it maybe two, three millimeters more proximal, you would think. But on the other hand, then I would create more shoulder as well. So it's a compromise I make here. And what you see is that there is a, a very, this, this trabecal will be covered. Uh, that's normal that there's still some contrast going through the device. It's never a complete immediate closure from in the beginning. Uh, the fact that there is a very slow washout of the contrast here is a sign that, that it will uh, occlude on, after a couple of weeks. So that's what we do, a control uh, TEE or a control CT after 6 to 12 weeks. I would recommend more 6, uh, sorry, 12 weeks. The official instructions for use are study-related uh, uh, ways. Um, protocols have typically been in the past six weeks, but I think it's um, there are more and more uh, data that after 12 weeks, it's actually a better time point to do your control uh, imaging. So this is on ECHO. Uh, you see there's no uh, PERI device leak. You have a very nice compression, not, not much too much protruding of your device. So this is, I would say, it's an excellent uh, implantation. And then we do the final uh release so for the final release you saw i brought my delivery sheet close to the device again i would never do it with several centimeters of gap between the delivery sheet and the device because then your that that um, cable could go anywhere it could suddenly if there's a lot of torque on your delivery system it could still damage the left atrial wall so that's um what i had to share about this um about this case and in total about the pre-procedural planning with the with ct for amulet and watchman flex so i'm Open for questions. Ali, that was uh, fantastic and extremely, extremely practical. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. We really enjoyed that. So we have a number of questions on the chat, uh, but we also have Dr. DiBiazzi. Luigi is um, the head of EP uh, at Monty, and, and he really started up our very successful LAA closure program. And I know he wanted to ask some questions too and make some comments. So maybe Luigi, we'll start with you. Thank you, Ole. That was a great presentation. Uh, I agree with uh, uh, everything you said. Actually, we had the same issue here. And I think when you want to start a new program of LA closure, CT makes a huge difference. Uh, once you become uh, familiar with the procedure and you have a you know, good training, it's probably less relevant uh, because, uh, you know, with uh, you can, you know, actually the advantage is the Watchman Flex has made this change because with the fourth generation Watchman, you really didn't know before. Now yeah. with the Flex, you know, it fits probably 95% of the anatomy and uh, therefore, you know, the pre-procedural planning reduce the relevance. But during... Uh, pandemic you know having the patient coming from ct before make things much easier so i completely agree when you start a program and even after having ct makes a huge difference we also use the uh, eyes uh, uh, the majority of the time since we are very familiar with implantation or with the ablation with eyes in us mm -hmm. you know for us doing eyes it's very easy and you know we even use the 2d eyes only to do yeah, some yeah. cases before the 3D became uh, available. Uh, one question that came into the chat is, uh, what is your anticoagulation uh, uh, protocol before and after? And uh, what do you do if you have a, uh, a leak Yeah. Uh, at follow-up? And the second question I have for you, very difficult, uh, is, uh, you know, the amulet has, co has been compared to the flex to the watchman first generation. And you know that the, the, the flex has reduced the complication to almost nothing. There's, yeah. there's never nothing in medicine. So do you think they should do another comparison with the new generation watchman? Because right now, uh, in my mind, we are so good with the flex that I, I think about the amulet uh, as uh, the alternative to the 5% of, of anatomy that are not uh, good with that. Yeah. <laughs> Now, first about the anticoagulation. Uh, well, in Europe, as you probably know, the majority of centers and large centers, they do actually single antiplatelet immediately after the... So they stop immediately all the anticoagulation and put these patients on single antiplatelet. What I would say is, I mean, it's not that uh, binary, zero or one. I mean, it's a very... The, the population is very variable. It's a very... I mean, sometimes we have referrals of patients because they have done a ischemic stroke despite 
uh, oral anticoagulation. Of course, these patients, you continue oral anticoagulation. We do then the LA closure on top of it, but uh, also depending, is it just a high bleeding risk or did they really have a, a bleeding, a major bleeding already that also can influence. But my approach is also in 80, 90% of cases, single antiplatelet. I don't think, to be honest, we have anything to win with double antiplatelet. There are numerous studies now that show that double antiplatelet is probably as toxic or as it gives your, your patients as much bleeding as oral anticoagulation while you don't gain anything with it. So it's either single antiplatelet or if you think your patient is robust enough, he can have anticoagulation. Maybe you don't lose anything by putting them for these first six to 12 weeks on single oral anticoagulation without the platelet, I would even say, and then uh, do a control. I, I completely agree with you. And we co-authored, I co-authored a paper with my colleague in Texas where actually dual antiplatelet it's very high bleeding risk. And uh, actually we're switched now to low dose NOAC. So yeah. we do all, all our procedure with a low dose NOAC. Mm -hmm. So we switch at 45 days. Yeah. Or for people that have prior hemorrhage in the brain, we, we do the whole procedure with low dose NOAC. Otherwise we yeah. switch at 45 days. And yeah. after six months, actually we believe in atriopathy. So when you have to decide if long-term aspirin versus low-dose NOAC, I mean, looking at, you know, if we had done the ablation and we know that there is, a, you know, an atriopathy there in addition to the, to the stroke risk due to the appendage, we actually remain the patient on low-dose NOAC. Yeah. So this is something new. We are actually going to so start a my style on this. I mean, so you, you do single antiplatelet therapy from day one, right? And aspirin or Plavix? Well, if the patient can tolerate aspirin, it's aspirin. If, if there's a contraindication or it's like a upper gastrointestinal bleeding problem, so then we put them on clopidogrel. Yeah. Okay. And irrespective of device? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. And but I have I've to say, I mean, these we, device related thrombosis problems, it's we, we scan our patients even always three months after. We, and CT is very sensitive to detect the device related thrombosis. I mean, this is not more than three, four percent of our patients. It's very rare, you know. I mean, some reports about saying 15 percent, 10 percent. This is not we, something we've ever seen. Despite single antiplatelet therapy, right? Yeah. Azim, we reported a paper uh, because for the stent, actually, you are very familiar with it. There is a resistance to the clopidogram. And we did the, the genetic testing in a series of patients. And mm -hmm. we find out that 25% of these patients have both the allele abnormal. So there is a, a quarter of patients that have resistance to the clopidogram. Yeah. So that this is the paper that set the stage for us to go for low dose NOAC rather than single antiplatelet. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about you know the resistance to clopidogram, which in the stand field is pretty well known? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, in the STEM field, even though it's known, you know, we looked at it, we did all sorts of randomized studies looking at P2Y12 levels and, you know, using Verify now. Unfortunately, none of the studies were able to show a difference from actually measuring platelet activity and switching to more potent antiplatelets. So for most part, we still use Plavix, understanding that there are some patients who will be uh, clopidogrel resistance. Um, but what we've learned about clopidogrel resistance, it's not an on-off switch. So we've, you know, we've tested patients and shown some patients are resistant, then they become, they actually have um, activity again, and they're not resistant, and then they become resistant. It can be very variable. So in the STEM field, you know, even though we know it's there, it's strange enough, it's not being used in clinical practice uh, routinely to guide DAPT. But uh, you did have another important question for Ali, your second question about peri-device yeah, leak. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it. the thing. I mean, you know, if you do cardiac CT, you will be surprised in 35% of cases, you still see some remaining minor leakage, sometimes be, I mean, beyond the device or the proximal end of the device. But very often you don't see any clear para or peri device leak. So I think that you have to make a real discrimination between devices who are probably not completely in the yet and where the, the contrast is just running slowly through the device. In fact, that has no significance because let's say it's even a thrombus be be beyond this. I mean, it's still a nitinol network there which will hold uh, the, the, the thrombus. Yeah? So it's only peri-device leaks where we're interested in. And then typically, well, 
if the leak is more than than five millimeter, I think you really have to do something about it and go for a for a procedural closure. And we have we have have a couple we've done a couple of cases. I mean, we've done now I think roughly seven hundred LA closures, but maybe only four or five uh, additional closures on top of this. And now we're like uh, period device leaks of more than five millimeter. If you are, have these mi minor leakages of for sure less than three millimeter, you can't do anything. You cannot do interventionally do something. And then it's really, yeah, you have to make a balance. You know, it's a balance between how, how, how high is the bleeding risk of that patient? Uh, can you really, or can you put them on low dose NOAC or could be a good solution for these patients or, but that that's uh, all to do if, if it's a patient who had already two times an intracranial bleed, I'm, I, I'm not sure any neurologist would accept me starting for some minor peri device leaks on NOAC uh, again. So that's all to do with what kind of patient we have. And what, what do you, what do you close the leaks with when you do the five millimeter larger leaks? Do you put an it's AVP? an AVP plug. AVP plug. Two or yeah. three? Typically three. Yeah. Typically three. Uh, in the craziness that we have, because uh, I got trained in a center where they pass almost 1500 uh, uh, watchman device. And uh, uh, we published three series where actually patient having TIA or stroke with, uh, with the leak, even less than five millimeters. Mm. So we, we, we published three solutions which one, of course, is the one that we prefer. One is uh, when the leak is less than five millimeters, go with an ablation catheter on the opposite side of the device and, and give radiofrequency energy, activating okay. the inflammatory process to close it. That's unique. We, yeah. We've actually published this on Jack Intervention. It's a very nice paper. And uh, we're trying to do, I mean, we hope not to have leaks, but there are leaks. So uh, yeah. this is interesting. Then a second one, that we got familiar with is the uh, use of coils. And, yeah. uh, you know, we have used the coil to go in the small, mm. but, you know, it's a very difficult, even for reimbursement in the US, it's a problem. And mm. the third one is actually what you guys do, which is uh, using the coil and, you know, unplatzer or smaller device. So putting a device to close another device, yeah. which looks crazy, but for the patient still avoid the surgical intervention or something else. These are all patients that experience you know, a TIA or something due to that leak. And yeah. there is a discrepancy in the literature about are this leak clinically relevant or not? You will, I mean, mm. people will say no, but actually there are patients that have experienced TIA and stroke in a, in a big number. Yeah. yeah. So I would with say with the, with the last devices we have, as you say, Watchman Flex 2, these devices have become more and more conformable so this, this, and that's a good thing, you know, the architecture, the design of these devices yes, have become yeah. more and more conformable. So I think the number of significant leaks, para device leaks has really come down dramatically. I mean, yeah, the only issue is that now that we open, you know, imagine, you know, you, the US market, you know, yeah. there are a lot of people starting doing the procedure. And as you know, 70% are excellent. They have an uh, imaging guy and everything. But once you open to everything, I think we are going to see more leaks than before because people are going to just yeah. shoot, leave the device there. And we have to deal as major centers with these issues. So yeah. I think that's actually for us more, more work to do. Yeah. No, no. So, so Ali, there are a couple of questions from the chat and then I'm going to pass it on to the fellows. Also, we have a few questions. We're going to keep you for a few minutes longer, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so the whole question of Watchman versus Amulet comes up a lot, right? I mean, in Europe, uh, certainly when I was there, we had both available. So we had, you, you got experience contemporaneously with both. And it's, that's unique. In the US has been one and now the other one's being introduced. So mm -hmm. in your practice where you have both available, and I know you, you even have other devices available, but let's concentrate on Amulet versus Watchman Flex. How do you choose from one case to the other? I mean, is there specific anatomies you prefer one or the other? It depends how you wake up that morning. <laughs> uh well i mean it's true i mean it's not that i it's not as with tavi where i have a more outspoken really i really do patient tapered valve choice especially in europe we have more devices also on the shelf so there are some better with some anatomies and others and here i think both um, uh, amulet and watch flex they can tackle and uh, they can really obtain good closure in 90 95 percent of all cases but still i mean if there is any different like let's say uh, you have two lobes with a very uh, short landing zone in front. Let's not more than 12 millimeters depth. 
with the watchman flex you would have to choose to go in one or one or the other lobe where the watchman flex you because the lobe is only 10 to 12 millimeters yeah so that in that scenario you have maybe something to win with an, an amulet because you can land in front of the carina of these two lobes and implant your your lobe there in front um also very angulated um very like where there's almost no landing zone so it becomes immediately angulated your appendage sometimes and you saw the case that i showed actually the live case yeah. you have to you have to go with your watchman anyway in that lobe you cannot get it more vertical implanted because it, you need some depth for that device yes so okay. then it's a compromise of that you how proximal can you go to you cannot close completely up to the common and rich sometimes. So if I see on the CT that the trabecals, they go very proximal, really proximal on the side of the left upper pulmonary vein, you have something to win by going also an amulet. Then you can just bring your lobe in and then you can bring that disc out in the left atrium. So it gets really all the way to the common and rich. So, but of course, that's a minority of cases. It's not, it's maybe 5% or less than that of the cases. So I would typically say both are good. Uh, and both are also pretty conformable. Maybe the Watchman Flex is even more conformable, uh, the newest one, than the Amulet. The Amulet is a bit more stiffer, the lobe at least, but you have that advantage of that, that disc. So in some, some specific anatomies, as the ones I described, you can have a more proximal closure with that disc than with that Watchman Flex sometimes. Actually, so would you say that, sorry, one sec, would you say that in what, 80% of cases or 90% of cases, they're interchangeable? Yeah. Okay. The, the, if, the difference, Azim, is that if you look, there are three publications coming from the NCDA registry with 27,000 patients. If you look at the complication with the procedure, uh, unfortunately, the flex is much better and the, the, is going much down. So uh, uh, if I had to select by that, I think if I have a safer device for even later fusion over the long term, and I'm very familiar with it, I would limit the use of the amulet to the you know, percentage of cases where it cannot be done. But I think it's a safer device right now. What do you think, Ole? Well, it also depends on your the experience with the device. In Europe, there are some sites who never had a lot of experience with the watchman and then they did most of the amulet and they have excellent results. But having said this, I think on the amulet device as it is nowadays, these... The only thing that annoys me a little bit, about, I like it very much, but the only thing that annoys me are these late pericardial effusions. And yes. the, yes. the reason for that is probably because of these, these hooks, these anchoring hooks, they are sometimes too long. Yes. But I know that in the next generation, which will come there next year, yeah. they will have other uh, anchors. Um, so then yes. I think uh, these more kind of fish hook hooks, yes, which are much shorter but, and more if, efficient. So that's the only thing that I think is a clear setback for AMOLED compared to the Watch Flex. Otherwise, I think it's a nice device. It's very conformable too. You can have the, you have that disc uh, pacifier effect. So I wouldn't uh, say it's a, it's a. I mean, I think they're interchangeable for the majority of cases. But you have to be careful. Um, if 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 you see a pulmonary artery, uh, if I see a pulmonary artery just running next to my appendage, I'm not gonna put in an AMOLED to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> <All right>. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple of other questions uh, from the chat. Um, I mean, you showed and we've seen, you know, the, the LAA anatomy is so variable. Um, and you in, um, in rigs, you guys are using FAOPS and you're using 3D printing. I've seen you using a lot of your live cases. I mean, do you think we're going to get to a stage where we do patient specific uh, device selection or... This procedure, it just complicates a procedure that's fairly simple. Well, the, 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 I think probably not. I mean, in the beginning, if you would have asked me a couple of years ago, I would have said, yeah, maybe we, we would work. We, we're going to a more patient uh, specific models design. But I think probably with, if you see the, the better way is to, to work towards very conformable devices, mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. now the Watchman Flex, it's super conformable. Or there's another device we're working with. It's called Omega. It's also much more conformable, that cup. So I think it's even despite the fact that it's indeed very variable anatomies, but probably if we if we can work to the most optimal conformable device, which fits itself into all these anatomies and shapes and turns of that appendage, 
and 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 still gets a good closure and anchoring uh that's probably more the way to go i think otherwise it complexes probably or what could be thought of i don't know these are just wild ideas but uh, th that you would say you 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 get something in which where you ang you where you close the ostium what you anchor it with and then you inject something in it so that it 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 forms itself uh, like a foam or something you know that it it yeah. it, uh, it it also conforms itself to the anatomy but that's just some uh, yeah, while thinking, but that yeah, could also yeah. be. Yeah. I think that could work. So, well, somebody in the chat asked if that was possible. I think there are companies working on that. And there's yeah. also companies working on, on devices that are almost like a balloon that you inflate them with and fill them with liquids. So they actually really conform to the anatomy. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah. there's going to be a lot of more devices available. Maybe yeah. we'll take a couple of quick questions from our fellows. Uh, we've been dying to ask you a few questions. So Andrea first, maybe. Yes. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you for your talk, first of all. And second, I wanted to ask you about sizing. When ICP is not available, how does ice correlate with transistor geo, angiographic, and the other measurements? What, what do you use? Yeah, but eyes, I would say I would be super careful with it. I, I would never trust on my eyes measurements. It's always a two-dimensional. It can be a slice. As you, as you know, you know, it can be an, if it's an oval, your, your measurement can go from here to here. It can go from there. It, you, nothing says that you, you measure it nicely in the max diameter. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust at all on, on my eyes for my measurements. But um, if it's 2D eyes, yes, then I would even trust more on my, on my angiography. I mean, that, that gives you information. You know that it, un it gives you an underestimation. But uh, if that, let's say you really don't have any other means, uh, tools, uh, you, you couldn't do a CT, you, you don't have TE, you only have two DIs and your fluoro, I would trust still most of my, on my fluoro, on my angiographic uh, contrasts uh, injection and make a, a, an, an assessment there. Yeah. Do you think we, the new 40 catheters will change this? Uh, yeah, I've tried a couple of 4D ice catheters in it. It's not that easy, let's, to be honest like that. I mean, it's first of all, not that easy to steer the, the tip, uh, or at least the one I used from Simmons, the tip was very flat, floppy, so it was even harder to get across the interagial septum and squeeze it together with the delivery sheet through it. That was one thing. And then you can nicely see typically that ostium, yes, but uh, deeper down, it's 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 it was still, it was not that easy. I didn't find it a big help in my procedure. Uh, I still think it was clearly easier. I use that eyes just to guide me safely through that procedure to do a safe transeptal puncture, to see if my device is deep enough, to see, to put some color on if the device is in place. And, and that's basically it. To, to really count on that for the eyes, it's maybe possible if you have, it's a matter of experience, I'm sure. If you will have enough experience, maybe you can do it. But I'm not there yet, personally. Yeah. And I'm not sure if anybody is there. Thank you. Um, then short questions, guys. Samina? Thank you so much for the great talk. I have uh, just an uh, overall question. With the amount of uh, detail information that you get from the CT planning before the procedure, do you still doing T on a routine uh, base as no. a part of pre-procedural? Pre no, we don't, we don't do at any moment in these patients T. Our patients don't like it anyway. So not pre, not during, not after. We, they never get at any moment a T for us. Yeah. So, Oli, what happens if you find a LAA thrombus despite the fact that the patient was on anticoagulation? So, the patient's on the table, yeah. you do your baseline ice before you do the transeptal puncture, I assume, to check the LAA, uh, yeah. and you see a thrombus. Yeah, well, we, we've had, this is very rare, let's say that, first of all, I mean, many centers, they do even the CT the day before the procedure, so that typically reduces the risk that you find such a thrombus uh, and even we don't do, we have these CTs uh, one or two weeks before the procedure. And I can only remind like one handful, maybe three or four cases in uh, several hundred cases where we did. Then it's for me, it depends where the thrombus is. If it's very in the distality, I've done a couple of cases where I just continued with the LAA closure and just uh, put in a Sentinel device, cerebral embolic protection. And then you know that you should do it as a single shot. You know, you don't go very deep in the appendage and you stay very nice proximal and you place a device with a single deployment. And that worked out very fine. And these patients never had a, an, a, an, a neurological event. Of course, if the yeah. thrombus would be in the proximal part of the LA, I would say yeah, then if that's done that one out of 500 cases, then I would stop the case, put them on anticoagulation and, and for sure not proceed with the case. Okay, but you use cerebral protection, which I think is, is really important. 
Uh, the yeah, ones well, I've in done. all cases, but in this particular cases, yes, we did, and we we did a couple. Like I think in total, fifteen LA closures with cerebral umbilical protection, uh, just that we were doubting for one or another reason, and yeah, exactly. better saving. Sorry, yeah. exactly. Uh, Pierre Pasquale. Um, so thank you so much for the talk. Just wondering for patients that cannot undergo CT, uh, do you think there is a role for TE fusion with a fluoroscopy during the procedure for left atrial appendage closure? Yeah, yeah, sure. You can do that. I know a colleague from me in, in, in the Netherlands is doing this. So I, I think these few, we're just in the beginning of all understanding and using these fusion, uh, fusion fused images, uh, whether it's and, and it's even more accurate, yes, because it's a real time image, your TEE. So uh, that's even more accurate than the CT, which is a non moving structure. Uh, I calibrate it with a pigtail in the aorta, and typically it works very, very nice, but still, TEE fusion imaging with your, with your fluoro gives even more accurate images. Then you can for sure do, uh, I mean, you can do it with an absolute minimum of fluoro and contrast, et cetera. Sure, you can do that. Yeah. Well, yeah. There was like a, kind of going on to my last question about. What do you do with patients with chronic kidney disease, creatinines mm -hmm. above two, GFRs yeah. below 30, uh, where you yeah. don't want to inject any dye, you can't, you don't want to do a CT. What's your approach, Ali? No, these cases, indeed, that's the only cases we still keep on doing in general anesthesia, typically. So we don't, and then you can do these cases, then we do them with TEE, and then, uh, yeah, fusion imaging would even be great. But then you can you can do these cases, if, if necessary, with an absolute minimum of contrast, like 30, 40 cc of contrast, and okay. yeah, you can do it. I wouldn't right. do CT and uh, then eyes guided, etc., because then you start giving contrast anyway again, so uh, no. Fantastic. Ali, thank you so much. We really enjoyed today. Uh, it was a great discussion. Luigi, thank you for joining us. It's always great to have a an expert from our team join us for these talks. And Ali, I look forward to seeing you soon in Paris. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good job.